Okay. Six regents, a deputy commissioner, and two campus presidents. I think we're ready to begin. So at this time, I will um, look to Regent Buchanan to uh, lead the conversation uh, regarding the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee. Regent Buchanan. Thank you. Um, and committee members on this committee, thank you for the time that you've put in in the last couple of months. We've had a media agenda with a wide breadth of topics, I think, that we've really put some considerable energy into, so that's great. Uh, Deputy Director Moisey, why don't you start us off with an introduction of uh, item A under the consent agenda, please. Um, uh, Chairman, members of the board, uh, item, the first item on our agenda is a, uh, if I can read it here, a level two uh, memorandum from uh, Montana State University, and I would uh, ask Provost Potvin to introduce those. Regent McLean, Montana State University proposes two new programs. The first is a Certificate of Applied Science Human Information Coding Gallatin College Programs. This is a certificate program that allows students to use classification systems to code health data, make it of high quality, secure, and accessible to uh, those who need that type of information. These students will need to understand patient diagnoses that are written and be able to understand what they are so they can be coded. With this certificate, students will be eligible to take exams for national certification in coding associates and coding specialists. The starting salaries uh, between $21,000 and $30,000 a year, and the need is strong in our community, and this addresses a workforce need. The second program is the pre-veterinary medical certificate. It's a 50, uh, 56 to 59 credit program that allows students to better map a career path for those individuals interested in going to veterinary medical school. There are 28 of those schools in the country. It can be a certificate for existing students or as a post-baccalaureate option for individuals who got an, a, a different type of major who wish to go to medical school. We have about 200 students in who are we think are pre-vet students now, and about half of these are expected to take this certificate. To be eligible for the certificate, even at entry, they need to have a GPA of 3.2, so these are for our strong students who have the ability to uh, proceed on to veterinary school. Questions? Any questions from anybody on the committee or members of the board? Any other comments or questions? Great, we'll move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Potvin. Um, on level item, item B, level one memorandum uh, to Dr. Moisey. Uh, Chairman, uh, Buchanan, uh, members of the board, the, the level one uh, 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 proposals come to the commissioner's office for uh, approval. These are uh, new program proposals, uh, terminations, uh, programs in moratorium that don't require significant resources or impacts on the campuses as opposed to uh, new degree programs, for example. Um, I, can, I can go through these if, if we, can we pull them up on the screen? Um, very briefly, um, these are listed by campus, whether or not these are approvals of new programs. Uh, there's a, a relatively uh, large number of uh, moratoriums and uh, terminations this time, primarily from Dawson Community College, uh, also several from Montana State University Billings. Uh, and uh, University of Montana. And, and, and these are significant in the sense that as we talk about uh, in the ARSA committee that we're adding new programs, new academic programs, we also on the campuses are doing program reviews to look at existing programs and responding to changing workforce needs perhaps or different academic priorities on campuses. And so this is again reflective of that process. and. Uh, 
I know we've had some discussions about this in the past, but, but again, this is a healthy part of what the institutions are doing in terms of, of looking at resources used on the campuses and, and uh, student involvement in these programs and, and uh, developing and changing workforce needs in the state. To tag on that a tad bit, during our uh, committee meeting last week, we had a, a pretty good discussion recognizing the, the large amount of moratoriums and sent out a, a request to a couple of the campuses to give us an insight into how much resource uh, flexibility this created by terminating existing programs and um, requested specifically a follow-up from Dawson Community College and appreciate the, the memo we received from there. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Schultz. I, basically, our thought was, let's start to quantify. Are, are we freeing up resources? Uh, well, let me step back a second. Uh, in their presentation in this document, if you look, some of the summary comments that they made are uh, needing to free up resources to do exactly that, to funnel them in areas where they're seeing growing enrollment. And uh, we asked for some exploration into quantifying that. And so we'll look forward to further discovery down the road related to that. But at the first, I got a nice memo here that I'll make sure we forward on uh, to everybody else on the committee and the rest of the board. It, I mean, what it Im immediately does is free up people. And if, if that instructor is in a program that's under-enrolled, uh, using that person to, to take on uh, responsibilities with a growing demand program on, inside the system is a great way to reallocate resources. So although it's not a change in the money being spent, it's a change in the application of faculty time. And uh, know that that's certainly an underlying initiative on many of the campuses. And as we pledged in the November meeting, we're going to um, do a little bit more uh, investigation into the program review. And this is kind of one of those examples where we feel like uh, the process is working right. We're, we're moving people around in reaction to where the demand uh, in our programming is. Uh, Regent Teal. On that note, I also wanted to make one more comment that I thought was important from that phone call where we recognized a couple of programs that had used the aspect that we have in a system where we can collaborate, especially on two-year programs using uh, remote delivery or other methods um, and I particularly noted um, a collaboration between Great Falls College and MSU Northern to provide nursing education in Great Falls. I know that uh, Deputy Commissioner Moisey had other examples, but it's not just uh, getting rid of degrees uh, or di getting rid of options. It's finding creative ways to share resources so we can continue to uh, provide a breadth of opportunities for students, but we can do so more efficiently because we're using that aspect that we are a university system. Any comments or questions? Uh, I was very appreciative for the candor with which the uh, chief academic officers operated in that conversation. And uh, it's clear that they've heard our intent as a board to make sure that the program review as it's being used is really moving and, and recognizing the opportunities that Joe just outlined and continue to do so there. Great, so that will move forward under the consent items. Uh, honorary doctorates, Dr. Moisey. Um, we have two honorary doctorate, uh, I need to stay back from the microphone here, uh, candidates, one from UM and uh, one from MSU Bozeman, and I'm assuming the presidents will uh, present those. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I'm very proud to uh, present candidates for honorary doctorate of humane letters uh, at the University of Montana, John and Susan Talbot. Uh, John and Sue um, live in Missoula, and they have been tremendous friends and supporters of the University of Montana for uh, many years. Um, they most visible uh, is our journalism school building, uh, which is named Don Anderson Hall, and Don Anderson was Sue's father, and uh, also a mentor to John. John came to Montana many years ago to run the Lee Enterprise uh, system, the newspaper system, uh, working with Sue's uh, father. Uh, he did that after a career with the CIA and then with TWA Airlines. They, uh, they were nominated by both the School of Journalism and the College of Visual and Performing Arts because of their intense interest in both areas and not only their financial support, but their tremendous loyalty to the University of Montana. They are wonderful people. They are the two of the most modest people that you will ever know, uh, but their contributions to the university, to the state of Montana, and to the arts in particular around Montana and, and around the country 
is uh, a tremendous accomplishment. So we are very proud to recommend the two of them for an honorary doctorate degree uh, upon your approval. These, they have both been through the complete process on campus, including approval by the Faculty Senate in executive session, uh, and, and, a, and a look by you at the executive session at your uh, January meeting. So I seek your approval there, and at the same time, I would like to just remind uh, the board that some time ago you approved the honorary doctorate for Sandra Day O'Connor. She has been unable to come to a commencement uh, to receive that honorary doctorate, but she will be coming uh, September 18th to receive that, so we'll have a special ceremony for her. And I just wanted to remind you that you had approved her at the past, so you wouldn't be surprised when she showed up on our doorstep. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or comments related to that from board members? Madam President? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Dean Rins. I, I just want to add that the faculty senate was unanimous, and if it's possible to say more than unanimous uh, in support of this proposal, that, that would be true. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Cruzado. Yes. Montana State University will have two honorary degree recipients in the uh, May ceremonies. Uh, since we're having two commencement ceremonies, we will be uh, able to honor two extraordinary individuals. Um, in the morning session uh, with the, from the College of Engineering, we will be recognizing our alumna, uh, Helene Michaels. Uh, Helene Michaels uh, came from Sweden some years ago, graduated from Montana State University, and started a very distinguished career uh, in, at Boeing, racing to be uh, vice president of operations and in specific responsible uh, for the, um, one of the, the main uh, aircrafts there. Um, Dr. Michaels has now retired. She lives in Missoula. And we want to make sure that we honor her and recognize her for her many contributions. Uh, she's an extraordinary mentor of many of our students, a regular uh, participant in events at the College of Engineering. And we find her story to be so compelling and so inspirational. Uh, I'm sure that our, our graduates will, re will uh, rejoice. In, in that ceremony, of course, we will also be recognizing our, our student regent, Joe Thiel, when, when he graduates. Um, in the afternoon session from the College of Letters and Science, we will be recognizing Diana Eck. Diana Eck is a faculty member in Harvard, specifically in the Divinity School. Uh, she is an expert in pluralism in religious uh, studies. Um, her family has been in Bozeman for a good number of years. She has strong ties back to the campus. so. They will be two extraordinary individuals that will be recognized on May, the, on May the 4th. I hope you join us. Thank you, Dr. Cruzado. Any comments or questions related to those two? Great, what an honor by both institutions to be recognized. Thank you for taking the time to recognize. So that will wrap up our only action item for tomorrow. We'll present it as an item uh, if anybody has the interest in singling out one of those or separating it from a consent vote, be prepared to do so tomorrow upon presentation, uh, but we'll move it forward. Um, moving on to information items, I think Dr. Pagano is probably the right person to help us with the pending action item coming in May. Are, Mark, are you prepared to visit about uh, your proposal for the Women's Studies Program? Come join us if you got a minute, if there's any questions. Excuse me. Chairman, Commissioner Regents, I'm bringing my Vice Provost with me. He worked on this proposal on campus in case there's any difficult questions. <laughs> anyway, uh, Montana State University Billings at the next board meeting is going to request permission to create a minor in women's studies. This interdisciplinary minor will be offered through the Soci sociology program in the Department of Sociology, Political Science, Native American Studies and Environmental Studies. All of the students in the College of Arts and Science are required to pursue either a minor or an extended major. So this particular minor gives another option to our students and at Montana State University Billings we currently have 62% of our students are women. 
So this is a very uh, robust, new, interesting miner for our students. It doesn't require any new resources, and uh, we'd like to propose that it be offered. Thank you. Any comments or questions related to this item? You're getting off easy again. Great. Well, we'll look for. Yep. Sorry, doc, Dr. Moisey. Um, Chair, members of the board, I'd like to comment on on some of the discussions that, that came uh, from the academic uh, academic affairs uh, meeting that that we discussed this proposal, and, and again that minors are sort of value added on campuses for students who are there. And part of the discussion was really the service learning component of this of this um, academic proposal and, and service learning. Uh, and service to the community as part of uh, MSUB's uh, part of the strategic goals or, or vision uh, for the campus. And so this one fits very nicely within that context. And, and that was a very good conversation to have uh, with the academic officers about how to include that as a major portion of this. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Deputy Commissioner uh, Moisey. And uh, one of the reasons we're just now bringing this to the forefront is this has been on our books for quite a while. And when we finished our strategic plan, and had civic engagement as one of our priorities, we decided it was time to propose this officially. Jeff. Yeah, the uh, University of Montana already offers a minor in women and gender studies. And I wonder if it would not make sense, um, a court can have, offer an amendment to uh, change the name of this program to women's and, women and gender studies. Either you'd like to speak to that? I will. Thanks. Uh, the, uh, the, the program that we're, we're presenting at MSUB, uh, the, the, chair of, the chair of the program has spoken with uh, U of M and MSU. MSU has a minor in women and gender studies. And reflecting the, uh, the particular demographic makeup we have at MSU Billings, uh, they wanted to concentrate this minor strictly on, on women's issues and not uh, add gender issues, but also a, a new, unique element of this program is uh, the, uh, the integral place of service learning uh, in the community uh, mm -hmm. to this program that isn't <laughs> reflected on the other two programs. Uh, Regent Pagan, if, if I may. Uh, uh, the, my, my main focus I, I, in making the comment is the fact that uh, there's currently a common course numbering rubric, WGS, and that all the programs in women and gender studies tend to be interdisciplinary. And uh, as we're moving towards the process of, of sort of releasing the rubrics so that we can cross-list under a WGS rubric, for example, those courses that are taken in different departments, um, you know, I'm, I'm just suggesting maybe it is a good idea. Um, whatever you do with the program is yours, um, but uh, being able to have that common rubric is probably going to be a, a good thing down the line. Yeah, we are using the WGSS rubric for the courses, yeah. And, Provost, yes, Donald. I had one more comment. All of the courses that we are using in this program are already offered on our campus. We're not adding any additional courses or resources, and they've all been common course numbered. Good. Any other questions, comments? We'll look forward to maybe some more discussion in May, but thanks for following through the process. Um, Brandy, is Brandy with us this afternoon? Hi, Brandy, American Indian update. Thank you for coming prepared. Good afternoon. Um, Madam Chair, Regent Buchanan, Commissioner and Regents, my name is Brandy Foster and I'm the Director of American Indian and Minority Achievement for the Commissioner's Office. Um, I'm here today just to talk to you a few minutes about um, some exciting collaborations that the MUS is doing um, with our tribal colleges. I know that with the legislature in session, there are always a lot of conversations about what is it that we're doing to reach out to our tribal college partners. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to invite a couple of my colleagues um, to discuss specific partnerships. Um, you did receive a bulleted list of some samples of collaborations that are organized by Tribal College. I think that you should be proud of um, the number, the, the breadth, and the diversity of those types of partnerships that we do have in place. Certainly there is room for growth and strengthening um, 
but I don't want to leave the impression that this isn't something we feel is important. <clears throat> One of the um, things that I also wanted to highlight was the partnership between the University of Montana, Salish Kootenai College, and the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education. We are co-hosting in June, um, or I'm sorry, at the end of May, uh, the National Native American Student Advi Advocacy Institute, and this is a partnership with the College Board. Um, it's a great collaboration. There is the uh, brochure was given to you, and I hope that we see some of your faces there. Um, it is something that we have the Tribal College presidents come to, faculty representatives from P20, uh, and um, community organizations. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a specific partnership, um, and that's the ISKNIP grant that is uh, a partnership with Blackfeet Community College and a couple of your campuses. So uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce Walena Oldperson. Walena is a, a program coordinator at the Native American Center of Excellence at Skag School of Pharmacy. Um, it's a position I held many years ago, actually, so I'm honored to have her here. She's going to talk about um, the program that they have, and then Dr. Heidi Pasek is going to come up and speak for a few moments about the partnership that Great Falls College has. So, Alina? Good afternoon. Thanks, Brandy, for the introduction. Well, like she said, my name is Walena Oldperson, and I am from the University of Montana. Hi, Royce. And um, I have two roles within my college, the College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences. I coordinate two different grants, the Native American Center of Excellence grant that um, Randy spoke of, which is to recruit and retain Native American and Alaska Natives into the pharmacy program at our college. So that's one of my roles. The other one is the program coordinator for the ISKNIP, which is a health opportunity grant funded by the Affordable Care Act that um, is to support TANIP or other low-income individuals as healthcare professions. And so, um, there's been 32 awarded nationally, five are tribal, and Blackfeet Community College is one of them. And they wanted to partnership with other institutions because they had so much money to give out. So um, they approached us, and we have a partnership committee at the University of Montana. We have um, Lynn Stocken, she's over there, as part on the partnership committee. We have um, Dr. Lori Morin, who is my direct supervisor on this project. And we have Frederica Hunter, who's a director of American Indian Student Services, and Terry Gruba, representative at a financial aid, because this is for a scholarship-based program. And so right now, we're in year three of a five-year grant. And at the University of Montana, we um, award differently. We're um, Blackfeet preferred. We're open to any. You have to be a state resident. But there's five other partnership sites out of BCC. So there's us, there's MSU Billings, MSU Bozeman, SKC, Salish Cooney College, excuse me, and um, Ray Falls College. So we all work with BCC closely. I'm emailing them daily or calling them daily. And so what we do with, at the University of Montana, which is my, my position where I can talk freely about because I know what I'm doing, hopefully. But what, um, what we do is we award 20 scholarships at a nice amount, $6,400 for the academic year which helps covers a lot of their tuition and fees, but also what the best part of it is that with this health opportunity grant, we're able to provide um, tutoring and mentoring. So they send additional funds for tutoring and mentoring, which I help coordinate on our campus with um, just different support services that Native students need. We, the transition from tribal reservation life to an urban setting has been hard. It was hard on me as an undergraduate, but look where I am. So we can do, this grant can do so much, and it has done so much, and the relationship that the University of Montana has with Blackfeet Community College now has grown, and it's just a great program. Um, I think that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions for me before I move on to our next speaker? No. Yep. Good afternoon. Chair Buchanan, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing at uh, Great Falls College. Uh, we are also partners in the ISKNIP uh, grant, and we have provided scholarships to 20 of our students, as Walina described. And we are also, we have had just the great pleasure and joy of opening a 
center on our campus that's really focused on the transitions that Belina was talking about. We find that our Native American students coming into the campus uh, often need just a place where they can gather, a place where they can receive certain services, and we were also able, through the Ishkinip grant that we received, to provide a coordinator to staff the center. And we recently had a wonderful event where um, tribal leadership from Blackfeet came uh, to our campus, and we had uh, an honor song, and, and our center was blessed by tribal leadership, and it was a wonderful and powerful experience. And one of the students spoke about the effect of the scholarships and the services uh, that the center provides in helping him to be successful uh, as he prepares to enter the nursing program. So uh, if you ever have a chance to come and visit our campus center, we're very, very proud of the space that we've dedicated to the Ishkanip Center on our campus. And we did choose to keep the name Ishkanip uh, Enrichment Center, Native American Enrichment Center, uh, to honor the whole project. So thank you, and I'll stand for any questions you might have. Hi, you guys got great press when you opened that. Uh, congratulations on that. It was all over North Central Montana. Thank you. Can, can you tell me what the percentage of Native American students that attend Great Falls College approximately? Do you, do you have a sense of that? I do. Uh, it's about the same as the percentage in our community, about 9 to 11 percent. Uh, we, we have a pretty high population of Native students in Great Falls at Great Falls College. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and of those students, do you, uh, do you have at hand the data with regard to their success rates, degree, certificate, completion? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Um, I don't have off the top of my head the exact rate, but I do know that the Native American students are most likely to stop out or drop out. Um, and it's because of that transition that Walena talked about, and we hope to really significantly impact uh, their ability to be successful on our campus through the efforts of not only the financial help, because that's very, very important through the scholarships, but more importantly is that way for students to connect. And, you know, we were talking before the presentation, even something as simple as being able to print an assignment. I mean, they can just go to the center. Uh, the coordinator is there to help them with those kinds of things. We have internet connection. We have everything that they need to be able to do those things so that we expect to see a, a, a real increase in their success rates. If I may just res um, uh, talk about that for a moment, the uh, one of the almost unknown success stories in the country over the past 20 years is the increase in attendance and completion by Native Americans in colleges and universities. Now, while it's true that their percentages are greater than any other ethnic group in the United States, we do have to bear in mind they started from a slightly lower number than some of the other ethnic groups. But, to, but when one considers success and gain, where they started is almost beside the point. It's where they are now with regard to increases in attendance both in numbers and in ranking, and uh, degrees, certificates, completion. It really is one of the great American and certainly uh, West, Western United States education success stories. And I think all of us wish we'd hear more about it, not necessarily from you and institutions, such as yours, uh, but just generally from the media, it's a big time story. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Regent Williams. Regent Teal. Just following up on that, I think that's a great comment. And um, next year, I think, would be the, the 20th anniversary of the 1994 Land Grant Act that founded tribal colleges. And Montana has more tribal colleges than any other state in the nation. Uh, are there any plans of, uh, that seems like an event that we should mark or recognize in some way. That's probably a great question for Brandy to address. So I'm gonna yeah, turn Brandy, the mic over to her now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
you know, I've heard conversations about that, but I, I don't know that there's anything um, planned. And I think that's a conversation that we could certainly encourage our tribal college partners to have. I, I would say that um, because there's not a tribal college system, you know, it's difficult. I can't go in there and tell them what they should do or, or anything like that. But I, I do know that they recognize that. And I think with Montana State University, perhaps we can invite um, some of our partners to look at that uh, as a land grant institution. I did want to um, address uh, Regent Williams too. I, I agree with you that um, we need to see the more positive side of that story. Um, but I would fail if I wasn't a reminder that there's always room to grow. In the state of Montana, our um, graduation rates for our, um, our first time student in six years graduation rate across the board is about 43%. And for our American Indian students, that's only 28%. So although I agree that we need to focus on the positive and every success story is important, um, we do have a lot of work left to do. Um, so I appreciate the time. We will be presenting tonight to the legislators as well um, so that they can see the work that we're doing. And I know that Walena had one last thing she wanted to mention just for your own um, edification here. Hi, sorry. I've, usually people always ask, what does Iskinit mean? And so I totally didn't mark it to let it be known, but it's a Blackfoot word that means Blackfeet way of knowing. It's from within. And so when they were thinking, when they received this health opportunity grant, they wanted to make it for the people. And so that's one of the reasons why they call it Iskinip. So just a clarification in case you guys wanted to know later on, what does Iskinip mean? <laughs> Thank you for your time. Can I just have one more quick question for Brandy probably? Um, first of all, this is incredible. Thanks for the list. Uh, of collaborations and it seems like really good things are happening. One collaboration that I think maybe could add to this is um, through Mass, we have a statewide association for student governments and I think that it would really contribute to Mass to have or encourage uh, tribal student governments or students to participate in that. Is there any way that we could try and connect or reach out to that group? There absolutely is a way, and I think that that should be student-driven. So if Mass wants to get together and identify some folks who are interested, we could do some campus visits, and I think that would be wonderful um, to look at the way those student government um, organizations work on the tribal campuses and see how they can enrich what you guys do. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yes, I, I wanted to congratulate uh, Brandy and University of Montana for this wonderful initiative. Uh, and working with Salish Kootenai and with Blackfeet College, I think that this is going to be a wonderful event. I also wanted to, to thank Regent Teal. He's learning very well that lesson about the power of the land-grant university. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a reminder, again, 150 years ago, in 1862, we had the first land-grant. Then in 1890, we had the second land-grant act, which gave access to uh, historically black colleges, and then a century went by. 100 years later, that concept, that, that dream of the land grant um, opened new pathways when uh, a commission was created to explore the possibility of a third land grant act. The person who chaired that effort was President Michael Malone from Montana State University. That's why Montana has more land-grant campuses than any other state in the nation. And I welcome that opportunity because I think that that will be a wonderful celebration. And since we do not have President Malone anymore uh, with us, we have another great champion of those days. His name is Joe McDonald. Thanks, President Cruzado. And thanks to you three. I mean, obviously, the, the good work that's getting done is on the heels of the passion and commitment that you're making. So you know you've got the eyes and ears of this group with support behind it. So thank you for the update and keep up the great work. Thanks, Brandy and all. Good conversation. Uh, Mr. Muffick, why don't you come up? We're going to put your feet to the fire here for a little while. Uh, veterans Workforce Update. And uh, I've been assured, Regent Krause, you've been a, kept abreast and a big part of this conversation. So we'll look forward to hearing some of your insights. Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the board. I have a quick update for you today on our uh, veterans work group. 
The uh, veter Veterans Work Group, as uh, you recall, was formed under our Veterans Initiative, which we started last summer. It's made up of a number of individuals from throughout the system and throughout uh, our, our political uh, spectrum as far as uh, from Senator Box's office and Senator Tester's office. Uh, we formed this group with the idea that we were uh, wanting to make sure that the university system continued to excel as a veterans-friendly system to develop best practices and providing services to veterans. We came up with a number of best practices, about 15 of them, which I shared with this group uh, in September, I believe. And one of those was to develop better data on the veterans. We didn't have good data. We came up with some round numbers, said we thought we had about 2,500 veterans. Turns out we were pretty close. Uh, there's about 2,200 veterans and there's 2,495 veterans and uh, dependents that are on uh, receiving some kind of veterans benefits. Uh, I'll give you this information just because uh, this is kind of the baseline that we need in order to develop a scope on what we're dealing with from veterans. We expect the number of veterans in the system to double in the next five years based on the troop drawdowns that we're seeing. And in order to, uh, we, we have the data as our starting point and now we're able to go, okay, now what can we do moving forward? We're going to do a better job with the data as well where we get to uh, some consistent coding in the banner system. Right now, the only way we know somebody's a veteran is if uh, they declare it or if they uh, receive veterans benefits, which we assume that's most of them, but there's actually some screens and some tables in the banner system that aren't utilized throughout the entire system, uh, for, uh, the entire university system that we're gonna now uh, start to tap into that information. So when I'm up here talking about veterans and when we're talking to the legislature about veterans, we're not just giving you raw numbers, we're able to say, here's how many they are, here's how they're progressing, here's what they're receiving in aid, and we started that process. We've made quite a bit of uh, uh, progress, and we continue to expect to, receive, to make even more progress going forward. Uh, if, Amy, if you could put up the list of best practices. Uh, as I said, there's about 15 of them. Uh, the bottom two, and they're not in any particular order, but the bottom two are the ones that we've tackled first. Uh, improving the data and tracking for veterans and dependents, which I just spoke about. The other uh, is reviewing the transferability, transferability of military training and courses. Uh, this is something we looked at from our veterans work group. Uh, we developed a draft policy and we developed it uh, with three things in mind. We wanted to provide for a consistent system-wide approach to the assessing and granting of credit for military courses and training. We want to make the process of obtaining credit for prior military training and courses as simple as possible for the veterans. And we want to improve the information so that the veterans are aware of the opportunities out there. Uh, we developed this policy, we based it on uh, the state of Minnesota, the Minnesota State College and University System policy. It's, uh, it's, it's basically uh, it takes the American Council of Education uh, approach. ACE is, is, has a very well established, uh, robust inventory of military courses and training and recommended courses that those would transfer in place of. Uh, some campuses are already using those to some extent. We want to just make sure that we're able to provide a consistent approach throughout the system. The work group uh, developed it. We sent it on to a prior learning assessment work group, which is a, a collaboration between our, our two-year education and uh, our group uh, from some of the veterans group. Regent Krause has been uh, quite a champion of this idea. And the goal here is to continue vetting this. We've, we've run it through our prior learning assessment group, we've run it through our veterans group, but we really need to include the, the academic side now. And so we expect over the next couple months to include uh, the chief academic officers, provosts, and uh, faculty members, and then come to this board in May with a recommendation that says, all right, here's what we have. We want to do whatever we can to help these veterans transfer in some credits from their prior military training and uh, courses. So um, that's our next step. I hope to be here in May with an actual uh, policy recommendation for this board to consider. That concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. Any questions, comments, or thoughts on this? You've really grabbed this and run with it. Thank you. And I know Regent Krause has been a big push behind that. So thank you for your continued encouragement there, Regent Krause. I suspect you're sticking here with the Affordability Task Force. I'd like to introduce a couple of thoughts as we talk about this. This is a group that you'll remember uh, has repeatedly started to tackle some conversations that uh, end up emerging as national themes. One of the first conversations we brought together, the uh, folks on the committee was talking about growing default rates. How do we do react to that? And I was just thinking, I mean, it's probably time we, we get a report maybe by the next meeting on any progress that's been made there. Um, but the, the chatter related to financial aid nationally has certainly continued to be elevated. And, 
Um, I just find this group to be as engaging and as, as quick to respond and come up with suggestions and implementation strategies as, as much as any group or any task force I've been a part of since I've been on the board. Um, Ron, I'll let you start it off, but I think that there's a lot of color that uh, the members of that conversation, uh, Regent Teal was on the last call. Uh, I know that a lot of us have some things that have got us quite energized, so please help us introduce the item here. Okay. Um, you know, there's so many different directions I've thought about how to go with this because this group has been tackling so many uh, ideas and, and talking about things at a macro level and a micro level. Uh, this group has existed for almost two years. We started it in June of 2010, I believe, and it continues to grow in the number of participants and in the type of participants. Um, one of the discussions we've got into recently uh, that I think is, 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 is pretty timely is the perception of affordability. We've talked about affordability uh, and the perception of affordability and how that differs depending on whether you're a regent, depending on whether you're a legislator, depending on whether you're a family. And it, that kind of is timely because the Department of Education has a bunch of different tools now that they are providing under their transparency initiative uh, that our data feeds into. There's the uh, financial aid shopping sheet, there's the college navigator and the college scorecard. Those are all three items that the Department of Education is, is really pushing uh, for students and families as part of their choice initiative and their transparency initiative. Um, uh, the feds have recently told me there's about 200,000 hits per, uh, uh, per month on that, uh, that website. So it's, it's obvious to believe that we've got some Montana families out there looking at that. We've had some discrepancies in our data or some differences. So this group is, is talking about let's look at this data. We need to make sure that what we're reporting is correct, that we're all reporting the same way. It goes through the iPads process. Uh, this group, uh, after our last meeting, has said, yep, we're going to tackle this. We have a financial aid director's retreat every year, uh, and we're going to address that this spring. May is our next meeting, and we're going to look at it from, from two, uh, two standpoints. The one I mentioned, which is the reporting of the data, and the other one's the calculation of data. Cost of attendance is a, a big piece of that, and uh, cost of attendance in the financial aid world is a, a bit different than when we talk about affordability. There's things built in there. It's tuition, fees, books, room and board, and then other expenses. And other expenses can be uh, travel, they can be, it can be transportation, it can be furnishings, it can be a computer. And there's some differences in how our campuses are looking at that other expenses. So we're going to convene this group, we're going to sit down, see if we can come up with some commonalities in how we are, are approaching the calculation and how we're uh, approaching the reporting of the data to hopefully get that uh, to be more consistent and, and uh, then our families won't be out there looking at these different federal uh, websites going, why does it cost $1,500 more to go to this MUS school than this MUS school? I thought tuition was frozen, you know, those kind of questions. So um, as part of the problem with those, those federal websites, um, they provide an average cost as well and the average cost can actually be a deterrent for our low-income students. So that's something else that we uh, have to really consider when you're looking at an average because an average amount that a student is receiving in financial aid, obviously the lower income are receiving more financial aid and the upper income are receiving less, it can be really discouraging for them. That kind of segues into the second piece that, uh, that we're taking on from the Affordability Task Force, and this is more of a big picture uh, macro level. And, uh, the task force has agreed that we need to begin the analysis of our state financial aid, uh, our programs, to assess the effectiveness and the strategies of our aid. We have our, uh, a number of state-funded aid programs, Montana Tuition Assistance Program, Montana Higher Education Grant, Governor's Best and Bright, Brightest Scholarship, the MUS Honor Scholarship, and then our Regent Waivers. Uh, the group has had a, had a number of discussions, particularly our last meeting, uh, to talk about those, uh, how would I put it, those programs have existed, some of them for 20 years, some of them for 30 years, the Governor's Scholarship for about the last seven, and they're all kind of a patchwork of financial aid. This, you know, this program targets this group, this program targets this group, and none of it's really brought together in a cohesive uh, approach or a consistent approach to what are we trying to accomplish with, with this aid. The group wants to look at how does this aid uh, align with the region's strategic plan? How can we um, 
target this aid better, or should we target it? And if, if we're going to get into the performance-based funding, should this aid then be in line with what the performance-based measures are uh, that are related to uh, each campus's, uh, whatever the campuses come up with for their performance-based metrics? So it's a, it's a big task. Um, it's some of the questions I don't think we've asked. You know, I've been with the commissioner's office for 20 years, and I know I haven't been in on a whole lot of questions about what is our overall, or a whole lot of conversations about what is our overall strategy for aid. And uh, so it's a big process. It's one that I think this group is really set up to address now. It's taken us a couple years to get there. It might take us another year to actually come up with some recommendations. We're already starting to analyze the data. I've got uh, one of our individuals back at our office looking at, let's take a look at our, our Montana Tuition Assistance Program recipients. Have they, what's their graduation rate? You know, what's their retention rate? And we haven't been able to answer those questions previously, but we're going to be able to answer those questions in the next uh, few months. So um, that concludes my report. Happy to take any questions or have any conversation about this. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to add a little bit of, of my thoughts uh, related to that last part of the conversation. I mean, we heard um, Deputy Commissioner Tyler Trevor this morning passionately describing his description of how we manage financial aid at the moment. And I think from what I've seen over the years, we certainly get a pat on the back and appropriately so for what it is we're trying to do. How it links with broader goals is certainly something that we think, feel like we can improve on. Um, but one thing that we constantly are getting uh, probably appropriately criticized for is the lack of actual money behind this effort. And so the idea that we had in this conversation was, okay, if we're going to agree to this performance-based funding conversation and we think we're headed towards a completion focus, what other tools within the system can we add to get us there, help us move that bar. And so this review would look at all things from the existing financial aid packages, waivers, things on campus to do exactly what you both articulate so well, which is create a cohesive plan which is aimed at an outcome. Um, not being as reactive as what I think we as a, a task force kind of agreed as to how many of the policies have already been created. All good things, let's make sure they're coordinated just as you articulate. Um, we think the group kind of articulates, we think this fits pretty well in this performance-based funding conversation. If completion is going to be the focus, these are things that can incentivize completion. And without knowing we were headed this direction in the fall, we put in some money that included progression and quicker time to degree. That was money on top of Pell uh, with need as a primary criteria, as it will continue to be, uh, but some other things, including completion rates and progression, things like that. So um, I know that it was my task to bring this group's voice to the table and ask the board to elevate this as a priority. And in, in top of that, they offered to be a leader in that and help us uh, do this review, kind of put together a case statement as to what we think, what kind of outcomes we're driving, what the approach we're managing now, and what changes we might make to help it be much more coordinated and cohesive. So. Um, I again want to say thank you to all the um, chief financial officers on the campuses that have been a part of this conversation. Um, highly rigorous, highly engaged, and my sense is there's not an idea that they come up with them that they're not ready to get behind the work it's going to take to take that next step. Um, I, I just think this is a, a very critical conversation, and uh, the more organized and coherent we are in understanding what it is we're already doing and what we think we need to do to get to the next step, the more effective uh, we can become in illustrating the perception of affordability and putting in the levers to make it much more affordable, or at least uh, potential students aware of what opportunities are there uh, for them to complete and, and engage. Regent Teal. Thank you, Regent Buchanan. Um, as you reminded me on the conference calls, I recall uh, that this is one of my top priorities. <laughs> and it was also a priority that, that Mass put forward as, as their second priority for the system. And, and I'm really glad that, as you noted, we were able to put some money towards it very, very quickly. And I think that this is really the next logical step, is to analyze these different pots of money and how can we make them work in unison a little better than maybe they are right now. I wanted to pull out uh, one thing that I really appreciate about the affordability task force is that apart from me, there's another student representative who's been on there. And I wanted to just introduce Lindsay Murdoch, if she can stand up. Uh, and she's been working on the task force for the past little while. And I think it's great that we, we can find other areas for students to provide input on, on these sort of issues that uh, really directly impact them. And I'd encourage other students in the room, if you're interested in serving on one of these task forces, providing a, an, a slightly different point of view, it has a lot of worth. I think it really does help uh, get the job done because, believe it or not, a lot of these people up here haven't been in school very recently. 
we, we have a couple things to teach them as they have a lot of things to teach us. So thank you. I'd follow on that. I don't know if Adam Cook is in the room. He's a student at Tech. He also has been uh, highly active with the group, and, and Joe's exactly right. The perception of those who are trying to influence and trying to impact is so valuable, and we thank Lindsay and Adam and, and other students that might be interested in, in getting in. I see Adam in the back. Adam, stand up and say hi. Thank you for, to you and Lindsay both for your commitment to this project, and we appreciate your continuing commitment to it. Um, any comments, questions, or thoughts from members of the board on this conversation? Well, we'll look forward to uh, taking that next step and encourage the board to continue this, this to be a priority. We think that we're learning a lot and that we are kind of anticipating finding some not so difficult shifts in our approach that could yield some positive outcomes. And uh, we're thankful for Ron's engagement in the conversation as well. No other comments on that? Okay, um, the final item of our agenda for information item today is an update on the collaborative PhD uh, in materials science. Um, and I want to give a little context as we start this conversation because it's been one that's been in the works for quite some time and uh, we certainly feel like we not only owe it to the system or the, the campuses who are engaged in it but the state uh, to start getting it ready to move forward for some sort of conclusion. Um, we've got a couple of different approaches on this. What the committee members uh, through great discussion of this want to break the conversation into two parts and it was articulated during our, our meeting over uh, the lunch hour with students that it's already gotten past uh, just our committee as an approach. The first being, when it was originally introduced, we were talking about a collaborative PhD program, um, which is something that we all are uh, very familiar with what is being articulated as the attributes and the value and certainly the preparedness of our campuses to get there. Uh, as this conversation has gone a little bit further, an element that's been introduced or taken shape is uh, who's got the granting, the PhD granting authority. So what we wanted to do as a committee is separate that conversation into two parts. Um, again, our intent is, is to move it forward so that we can, you know, uh, move, move it forward or, or leave it behind and we got to start taking some action. So at this stage, here's my memory of uh, the conversation and Neil, perhaps you can um, help give some color to this, but last we had met as a board, we had requested some real specific budgetary uh, information on it. I know that that information at the moment has been through the U of M Faculty Senate, it's been through Montana Tech's Faculty Senate, currently sitting with Bozeman's Faculty Senate for review, uh, and I did ask John Neumeyer and a colleague of his to come with some uh, outcomes or some, uh, what they've found is their Faculty Senate has gone through their kind of vetting process, so we'll talk about that. And then the second, and I think we're going to need a lot of help from Ochi on this one, is framing this granting authority conversation. Um, I think there's a perception from some that we're proposing creating a third research PhD granting institution. Uh, that may not be accurate, but we want to make sure that we're very clear on what it is that we vote on so that if that is the outcome, everybody on this board is aware of, of what was going on there. Um, but let's start with the collaborative the, the program itself. Um, and actually, I'd pass it to Dr. Moisey for a moment, if you wouldn't mind. Just giving a little clarity again on, on where, where it is in the process, some of the original findings, uh, and where we see it at, at the moment. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Buchanan, members of the board. Um, uh, as as uh, Regent Buchanan pointed out, this came to uh, the board as a level one in the August uh, uh, 2012 meeting as an informational item. Uh, generated a lot of discussion and questions and and out of that board meeting really tasked the three campuses to develop a truly collaborative uh, PhD program in material science and, and to that end we we uh, put together a, a, a group of representative of each, of each of the campuses including <laughs> academic affairs uh, faculty and, 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 and some of those faculty members included uh, Senate leadership on, on the three campuses and then uh, our office uh, was involved in that process too and, and really starting in September there was a, a, a strong uh, and dedicated uh, effort to, uh, to talk about what the curriculum was, uh, what the courses should be, uh, where and how those were going to be delivered and really looking at uh, all aspects of how do we do this in a very collaborative way and I, I would say that the proposal that came out of that group is, is, a, is, is great evidence of that collaborative effort um, and, and we really got down into discussions about what the courses should be, what the expertise was on the campus and some of those 
uh, very specific kinds of issues that, that are, are certainly have impacts on, on the students and the delivery of the courses and obviously the resources. Um, that's, uh, one, once that part of the, the um, process was developed, the, uh, the program, then we started looking at what are the resources required on each of the campuses to, uh, to be able to deliver that because again, that was part of the discussion that the board asked is, is what are the costs involved in, in putting together a PhD program and especially one that's done and delivered collaboratively across three different campuses because there's certainly some, some complications, uh, but also a lot of, uh, uh, of, of good reasons to do that across the campuses. Um, so the, that committee worked through, uh, pretty much through December, uh, developed the, uh, the proposal. That was submitted, I think, in January to uh, each of the campuses for the review process that all new program proposals go through, whether they're undergraduate or graduate. Um, and that has, uh, and is still going through that approval process. The second uh, part of, of um, uh, what the, the, this group of, of 12 or 13 or four, 14 people from the three campuses is working on is addressing the information requests from the board. The typical level two proposal process and the information required is, is much more tailored for a one campus uh, type of proposal. And, and it's complicated when you're looking at three campuses that are on two sides of the system. Uh, and, and have very different kinds of, of operating uh, uh, procedures, uh, uh, all the way down to what do we play research assistantships on campuses, how is distance delivery done, even schedules for uh, when spring break is and, and some of those kinds of issues. What I did with, uh, with the group is once we developed the final level two proposal is, is said, um, if we look back at what the regents are asking for, six specific uh, items came up. The first is, a business plan that includes revenues and their sources, detailed expected costs, and expected return on investment to the system. Uh, what are the expected increase in revenues and costs to individual institutions when granting PhDs? Uh, certainly two of the three campuses are already doing that, but one of those campuses isn't. Uh, a needs assessment report, uh, in other words, what is the need for PhD graduates in material science, both nationally and within the state. Uh, detailed uh, uh, local community and corporate financial support, certainly part of uh, successful research and PhD programs are, are having external funding uh, and corporate funding and, and protect, uh, perhaps in this case. Um, and then part of the process leading up to um, the proposal in August was having uh, the American Advancement, or Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, did an independent external review of the capacity and the resources on each of the three campuses and made a series of recommendations. So part of it then is to provide specific information coming out of that report in reference to uh, where the resources, faculty and staffing uh, will come from, technology, uh, and other uh, infrastructural sorts of needs. Um, and then also there was some discussion uh, from the board about outlining where particular fundraising efforts may come from uh, and what the results of that might be. So those are, uh, at this point, once we have uh, approval of the level two proposal from the three campuses, uh, what I'm proposing is, is that we address those specific in a separate document needs that the, this board has asked for, so it's explicitly in one place. That, a lot of that information currently exists in the 40 plus page proposal, um, but I think it would make the discussion uh, in, this, in the board much easier if it were uh, put into the format of a business plan to deal with that. I want to elaborate a little bit on, on uh, uh, Regent Buchanan's uh, uh, characterization of the decision making uh, when this comes to the board. The first is obviously on the merits of the level two proposal for a collaborative PhD in material science. The second decision is uh, limited authority for Montana Tech to specifically authorize them to offer a PhD in material science. And I think having it worded and, and specified in that way really gets 
to around a lot of the discussion about third PhD granting campus and what that all means. So again, the AAAS review uh, said that on that campus, as it, as it was the case on any of the three campuses, there is the capacity in that narrowly defined area to participate uh, and, and, and be active partners uh, in a PhD program of this sort. So I think if that second decision is very specific in that area, I think it'll help a lot in terms of the board's discussion about the costs uh, and, and the merits of, of that proposal. So as I think about a couple points in there that I think really stand out, the AAAS report to me said certainly qualified, certainly need for it. Uh, the questions are around those resources. So we're, we're awaiting some response there. Um, we as a committee have a couple of decisions we've made, but one is primarily we wanted to elevate the discussion here. We have not taken it much further than what we've just articulated. We really want the board to, to, to have a crack and, and provide guidance, questions, uh, and opportunities for further requests of information uh, to be appropriate with it. Um, the other thing that uh, we find very important is the process that includes the faculty senates is one that we don't want to rush. Um, they're the place where we're going to find the meat and the crux of any sort of concern or need for more information. And so um, I did, uh, I know that it's currently sitting with the MSU faculty senate and I know uh, Professor Neumeier has uh, come prepared to share some of their original findings. Um, but I, what I would encourage us as a board to do is, is please assess this committee has not made any assessment on this. We, we know it's a big discussion other than it's time for us to start getting to a point where we can move it to an action item. Um, so before we ask uh, John to come up and share some of the faculty senate findings or request for more information at, at MSU, um, I'd love any questions or thoughts from other members of the board as it relates to this discussion. Uh, if you feel like this is moving uh, forward the right way, um, any thoughts from committee members? Are we all feeling like this is the right approach to tackle this. Regent Williams. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud the deliberative process, and I'm wondering about timelines. Do, do, does, the, does your committee have timelines on this? Is there any indication when, uh, when the next step product uh, will come to this board and then what will follow that? I'm thinking about the fact that our meetings are uh, timely but sometimes few and far between <laughs> and uh, I'm just wondering how, how long this might extend. What we have agreed is that at this stage it's still in the vetting process with faculty senate at MSU and we, w we don't want to get in the way of that and so we've encouraged them to expedite that review. Uh, and as soon as they have done that, and if we are comfortable with a recommendation that it's ready to move forward, we would be prepared to put it up for a vote at that point. That's the collaborative PhD element. Uh, the limited PhD granting authority, um, I think the way that uh, Deputy Commissioner Moise just articulated it, it is probably ready to go as written um, with limited PhD authority if we agree that the collaborative PhD moves forward. Um, if there were a broader discussion that wanted to be open, be open by the board, then I don't think we could link the two. I don't know if I'm right, uh, if I share that assessment, but we're, at this stage, we're still waiting for it to go through the, the level two process of review on, on MSU's campus. So the earliest it could be, and I think it's the anticipation of Chancellor Blackhead, our hope is that as early as May. Um, so it would require some board review of these findings, uh, which I think are considerable, so that uh, we are prepared as a board to either or to vote in May. So it could be as early as the next meeting. And one further question, if, if it was uh, a May decision, would, uh, d uh, do we think there would be enough time uh, before the start of the, the next school year to, uh, you know, execute this? I'm going to have to defer to Deputy Commissioner Moisey on that. Um, uh, Regent Williams and, and members of the board, um, that, that, that's certainly a, a uh, part of the decision, although um, the longer term implications, I guess, of, of appro approving a PhD program and gearing up in terms of developing external funding sources and resources are uh, you know, probably more of a critical concern, but I would assume that um, uh, the, the, you know, the capacities exist on the campuses. Uh, the idea is to, to I think it, it, it full 
uh, once the, uh, the, the program is in, in full swing, is to have about uh, 10 or 12 PhD students uh, in the program across the three campuses, and uh, that probably wouldn't occur by the fall just because uh, you, know, you would need to be able to advertise, students would, would need to go through the application process. But you know, perhaps there is limited opportunity in the fall, and I, I, maybe one of the uh, academic officers from the campus uh, could address that in more detail. But I, don't, I, I, I get the impression from, those, from having those discussions with, with the chief academic officers that to a limited degree, there would be a few students that could start in the fall if both, uh, you know, if the program were approved uh, in the May meeting. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Regent Buchanan, and thank you to you uh, for your leadership on this conversation and that of your committee. You guys have really um, thoroughly deliberated and um, uh, and have made the right might have and have made the right requests for for data and more information on behalf of this board. And uh, may I uh, ask uh, Chancellor Blackheader a few questions? Thank you, Chancellor Blackheader, for coming to the table. I, and I may, be, me, I may be getting ahead of myself with the questions, but I want to have the answers so that I can fully mull this over between now and May when, when this uh, could appear on our agenda as an action item. And so I just have a few questions that I would like clarification on from you. Um, so if we award uh, 12 PhDs, uh, let's say that we do, uh, authorize the collaborative PhD in material science. And if tech were to award uh, a th four of those 12 PhDs um, that we may see um, in material science, would tech um, technically be a PhD granting institution? Well, that, that's a good, that's a good Under question. Under the Carnegie definition. <laughs> Chair McLean, Regent Buchanan, you know, I sent some stuff to you before. I think it's important to get it out in the open. And it, it struck me just a few months ago as I was thinking about this, sort of the semantics of the, of the academics world, right, you know? And, and so when you look at the definition of a doctoral granting institution, if you look at NSF definition, I believe NSF is 10 uh, doctorals, doctorates granted per year for a number of years in NSF-supported areas something like that, right? And then if you look at the Carnegie definition, it's 20 doctorates in, in non-professional degrees. So that would eliminate a Juris Doctor or a medical doctor, but in a research. So depending upon which, which academy you want to be associated with, either NSF or um, uh, the Carnegie Foundation, you would have to have between 10 and 20 PhDs a year. So there's I've outlined before to some of the regents, you know, there are basically four things, right? One, you have to have authority to grant a PhD, and then you have to grant one, right? So that would get you. Then you have to grant multiple PhDs uh, in an area, or two or three, and then you have to do that for a multiple number of years. And there's some guidelines on that, but, you know, the expectation that Montana Tech becomes a Carnegie doctoral granting institution or an NSF doctoral granting institution just because you have authority to give a PhD diploma is not, is not a correct um, statement. So if we were given that permission in that limited area to, to give a diploma, a PhD diploma, we would be an institution within Montana that could give a doctoral degree in material science. And that would be the end of it. So I mean, I think that was some of the concerns Regent Buchanan had about what happens to the whole infrastructure and the, uh, Coupa standards on salaries, and so that's one of the things that I think we need to really be clear about. Now, what, what if 10 years from now we had this problem that we were giving 20 PhDs away? Uh, that would be a wildly successful doctoral program that doesn't exist in any area in the state currently, so I think that would be a problem that might be welcomed in some sense. Uh, I don't think it's likely, and so I think my point is is that, you know, even if and even if there were 10 or 12 doctorates in material science given away through this collaborative program, it still has to be within that institution. You can't share your accreditation through NWCCU and beyond is done individually on individual campuses. So you can't claim credit for, you know, 10 doctorates at Montana State or, or, or 10 at, at Missoula. So, I mean, it's our intent to be able to use our expertise on our campus. 
I would come back and just say, you know, my passion has been since I got here almost two years ago is the, the concept of, in particular, of being able to share coursework in these areas that, uh, that in our graduate programs in particular, where we have relatively small numbers and our ability to compete at the top flight and the national level is limited because um, uh, only because we can't collaborate as well as we could. And I think when you put some of those programs together in a truly collaborative fashion, it, it really gives us some opportunities as a state uh, to make an impact and to be good at it. This proposal, as I see it, is more detailed than any proposal that I think would, has ever come through the, the Board of Regents in Montana outlining how that collaboration could take place. So. I obviously have a very vested interest in it, but I also, from a philosophical point of view, think it's a, a real turning point on how we do graduate education. Mr. Regent McLean has more questions. I, I, I want to extend my gratitude to, one, your patience for us to figure out exactly how we want to approach it, uh, and two, your willingness and candor in providing exactly what you just articulated, one of the more thorough vetting processes that we've seen. And I think I mean, we're, going to work, we're going to work this to action. Um, and I think that your leadership on it has not gone unnoticed. We really appreciate your patience. And Doug Abbott and, and your whole campus yeah, no, and, and return and that, to that. And that committee of 12 that has been working, or it might be 14 now, Neil. But I mean, they've really done an outstanding job of trying to put it together. Uh, I, I've, kind of, I've kind of joked as I've gone through this process to think that, you know, and it's from, from previous experience, faculty uh, can collaborate fairly easily. And sometimes administration can get in the way. And uh, I just point that out that our, our faculty across our system in many cases are doing an outstanding job working together. And so uh, as administrators and as boards, just a little bit tongue in cheek, we ought to make sure that we uh, allow that to happen, if you will. Regent McClain, any further questions? Thank you. I do have, I do have another one just to, to make sure that I understand. And as we anticipate the business plan and, and we, we anticipate the conclusion of that, and I recognize that there's specific parts of it uh, in the level two submission, I guess, um, do you anticipate uh, should the collective PhD uh, authority be granted for all three institutions to, to work collaboratively to, to offer it, um, would there be any additional costs to tech uh, for providing uh, the PhD? Our, our budget is basically based, the answer is yes, and I think we've outlined that in our proposal. Uh, you know, I mean, I've never Above tried Above and beyond, though, the collaborative process, the collaborative nature. So if you did not get a PhD granting authority, you would be uh, experiencing those costs anyway, right? Well, and, and I think that all the, basically all the expenses in that collaborative process, right? If we're going to teach the courses and to offer the the, the courses and to advise the students and take the time to advise the students, that's where the cost is at. And you pointed out earlier, Regent Buchanan, you know, programs eliminated at Dawson and they can reallocate time, right? So we're already doing some of that advising, you know, with various programs uh, at Montana Tech in the, doc the doctoral level. So we're already using those resources in those areas. And so does it cost additional time or is it resources that we're already allocating towards there and currently doing? Um, it's not clear. We have had some recent success, although it is difficult. Uh, you know, when I go out to raise funds for the doctoral program, you know, they have the same question. Well, when the regents do something, then I'll do something, right? And, you know, you sort of get, when the regents do something, then, then we'll help. But they've been very supportive. Uh, Newmont is, is going to support a faculty position for us in material science. Uh, we have reallocated 150000 annual from our IDC account that we, that we develop on an annual basis. Uh, we have Residine that's sort of waiting for a PhD program to, to provide support for a student. Uh, and we have a, a couple of other companies that I don't want to put their names out exactly who are saying, you know, these, they, these are good ideas and we're going to support this program. But uh, they, they want to know the answer as well. So any kind of a nod that you can give that can move us forward with that will help us with that fundraising. And um, we do even have a couple of students to, to, to Neil's comment about do you have students ready we probably have a couple of students actually that are ready to go one of them is a faculty member actually so it's uh, it's a little bit loaded but you know one of them is a is a new student uh, that would that would start pr presumably in the fall if we got uh, approval for that so and funding thank for you and students. I guess I just I just would like to just make sure I'm on the same page with what with where the costs are um, so 
we have the three institutions working to provide it, working collaboratively to provide it. And uh, if the board moves forward in that direction and we do approve it um, for the collaborative PhD uh, with the two institutions, perhaps MSU and the University of Montana granting it, uh, tech would uh, put forth whatever cost they would already contribute to the program, right? Right. And so then those would be static irrespective of <coughs> your authority to grant a PhD, correct? Those would yes, still exist. Yes, we, we, we want the same thing I think that, the, that, that everybody wants. We want a successful program. We want a successful program in Missoula. We want one in Bozeman. Uh, you know, and, and if you look four or five years in the future, right, I think like all the programs we have at the graduate level or all of our programs, we should be evaluating that. If it's not working, then you know, why not? Are we not putting enough resources in it? Is it a field that we don't want? Uh, and, and, but I think that's the, the I, I think you have to go down the road a little bit to evaluate that and decide, yeah, are those resources being used wisely there or should we give up the idea and go on and do something that, that's, that's more relevant and more important? Um, it's something we don't do very well and you know, I don't have to tell the Board of Regents, right? You know, you can give and you can take away, right? I mean, you can evaluate programs and make those decisions as well or encourage us at least. Thank you. Thank you, uh, maybe, did I answer your question? Sure. Moderately did, yes. so. Yes, thank yeah. you. So um, we, we, I want to close this because we're at the end of our time, but I do want to give, we, we want to move this forward. And one of the pending conversations is faculty senate at Bozeman. So um, I know that you guys might have some preliminary findings. John, if you could, instead of going into the depth that perhaps you were prepared to, is John here, uh, Professor Numar? If, if you wouldn't mind maybe just coming to the podium and maybe summarize some of this. Uh, we do need to close the conversation, unless you'd like to wait to visit with the committee at a later date. Uh, do we have eight to ten minutes there, Madam Chair, in your agenda? I know we have uh, Mr. Malloy from the Governor's Office who was uh, targeted for, for 2.30 today. Thank you, Chancellor Blackheader. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, please. I mean, I, w this is a learning curve for all of us. We, we haven't been through a process quite this deliberative, and as we continually defer to the internal processes, we think this is a great opportunity because we have yet to hear these Findings and, and I don't know if they mirror U of M's faculty senate findings, Montana Tech's findings. We, we have no idea at this stage, but uh, perhaps if expedite just a little bit. But please share with us some of the the, f the things that are, are hitting your radar as you do this okay. review. Um, just for the record, my name is John Newmeyer. I'm chair of faculty senate, and this is Bob Makwa, who's the chair elect of our faculty senate. <clears throat> we have a couple of graphics uh, here as well that I'd like to show uh, very quickly, if get her attention. And uh, just to give you a status uh, update, the proposal was reviewed by our academics program working group on the 26th of February, and next it moves to graduate council on the 18th of March. It'll be reviewed by our faculty senate shortly thereafter, and then the dean's council. Um, and uh, just to give you sort of an idea of uh, what's been going on, one of the things that we did was we surveyed all of the faculty members who could potentially be involved. That's about 20 faculty at our campus. And we, um, we went ahead and, uh, can we move to the first graphic, please? And we moved to, um, and, and we, so we collected comments from them. We met with them in person. And then we also uh, took some time to um, collect comments from the academic uh, programs working group meeting. And uh, what I've prepared here is essentially just a condensation of those comments. So, um, and this first graphic here basically just shows our enrollment at MSU and the projected enrollment uh, based on our strategic plan uh, out until 2019. Um, the material science uh, program, it's an interdisciplinary field that capitalizes on expertise from chemistry, engineering, physics, and other fields. There is significant research activity at MSU in this area. Uh, about 20 faculty with many students having already received PhDs for research classified as material science. The title PhD in chemistry as an example is less important than the actual research area which ultimately defines where the graduate will find employment. However, many students are sensitive to name branding and choose a degree based on how it is perceived as a pathway to employment. 
In this sense, a PhD in material science will be attractive to career-oriented students interested in science, engineering, and technology. A strong PhD program in material science will meet the needs of future students desiring a degree in a rapidly growing, highly technical field with global demand, and it will further our mission of training young individuals in science and engineering fields. We've surveyed the MSU faculty, met with many of them in person. The general opinion is very supportive of MSU offering a PhD in material science. The major concern of faculty on our campus centers on fiscal resources. As a state with small population and tax base, the application of fiscal resources in creating new programs needs responsible consideration so that other important programs are not jeopardized. In particular, the three-campus approach is not perceived as fiscally responsible, and the political forces involving, involved in conceiving of this model have not fully captured the costs of starting and maintaining this type of program. If I could get to the next view graph, please. So I think in framing this concern about fiscal resources, I just want you to take a look at this plot, which shows the headcount on our campus, MSU Bozeman, and the number of tenure track faculty, both of these are normalized. So you can see the number of tenure track faculty is fairly flat and the number of students is growing through the years. And I think this captures where the faculty concern is about this uh, issue of fiscal resources. So tenure track faculty can conduct most of the research and student mentoring such as the material science program promises. This group is a critical measure of our ability to maintain a healthy research university with the top Carnegie ranking. Even though science, engineering, and mathematics are critical elements of land-grant institutions, at present our mathematics department, as was mentioned earlier, is in a dire situation, down by roughly 30% of their tenure-track faculty. They are hiring this year, but still, they are down quite severely. Other STEM departments, um, Mechanical engineering, chemical biological engineering, electrical engineering, and non-STEM departments are also under strain. I bring this up since adding additional PhD program at this time uh, could be deemed as unwise without giving responsible attention to existing needs, some of which are exceptional. Finally, I'd like to emphasize that present MSU faculty who conduct material science research have teaching and service commitments to their respective departments. Thus, they are unable to bear the burden of teaching and service responsibilities to a new program without sacrificing current obligations. The three-campus approach may have its appeal, but it aggravates the fiscal resource uh, problem. Keep in mind that research active faculty must mentor grad students in meaningful research, secure and maintain external funding, build and maintain research laboratories, guide current research, develop new research areas, and publish their findings. Faculty who nurture top class research programs in material science typically teach no more than one class per semester. UM has a handful of active faculty members in this general research area, but offers only two classes at present. Building UM into an active player in material science will be costly. Tech has a tradition of offering excellent undergraduate degrees and master's degrees, but the majority of the faculty listed in the proposal are not very research active. Turning that around is gonna be costly since existing teaching commitments must still be met, more must be added, and research programs must be ramped up. Keep in mind that a research inactive faculty member will find it hard, maybe impossible, to suddenly conduct meaningful research, publish, and obtain competitive grant funding. Such a drastic change on the campus will be realized with more faculty. The three additional faculty members requested in the proposal, one on each campus, is a modest step toward realizing a metamorphosis of material science research on the two campuses. Something absent in the proposal startup costs um, deals with um, the amount of money needed to uh, start a new faculty member in their research. Typically, a minimum laboratory startup package is about $500,000 for somebody in this research area. Otherwise, without this kind of funding, it's going to be hard to recruit and hard for that scientist to become successful. Furthermore, our committee felt that administrative needs are not emphasized. A program like this typically requires one staff member just to guide graduate recruitment and to assist existing students. 
our committee believes that the three campus model adds additional costs. If I could have the last, uh, the, next, the next one right there. Finally, our committee questions whether or not tech should be offering a PhD program. The graphic that I'm showing here illustrates the state population on the horizontal axis and the number of PhD granting institutions in each state. As you can see, only states with more than double our population have more than two PhD granting research active institutions. One can guess that the main reason for this is associated with cost. There are many costs associated with conducting PhD level research, human resources, space, equipment, library holdings, administration, and so on. Should Montana become the only state with a population of one million people with three or more PhD granting institutions? That's a question that the board is going to have to confront. John, thank you, our Professor Numar. Okay, um, thank you. Thoughtful, uh, much appreciated. I think what I'm hearing, Chancellor Blackheader, is is the same request that uh, Neil was outlining. I mean, let's, let's put this business plan in front of the regents and give us time prior to the May meeting and crafting the agenda to make sure everybody's comfortable with identifying the resource gap and strategies towards getting there. Um, and I would remind this board that we saw a huge gesture of commitment in Butte that's going to take our involvement in fundraising to go get uh, and I'd love to quantify that a little bit and what your anticipated impact of efforts like that might be. John, thank you for the report. Okay. Sorry to rush you, but I do want to, uh, President Ingstrom. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Buchanan. I just want to make one factual correction on the graph right there. I came from a state, South Dakota. Uh, there are three institutions there. The South Dakota School of Mines and Technology offers mm -hmm. several PhD programs, including collaborative PhD programs with USD and SDSU. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to point out that factual correction. Thank you. Thank you. The same is true with New Mexico. There are three doctoral institutions there. Same with Idaho. <laughs> is that right? And I think yeah. that's a very important conversation because we just heard from oh. Chancellor Blackheader the clear distinction between an institution who can grant a PhD, I don't even know in New Mexico. What is and in this case, we're talking about one PhD in material science and a PhD granting institution based on the definition, and I think there's two definitions out there that we could use that support that. So I think those are very important addendums to, to this and very important contributions to the conversation. Thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, let's ask this of Ochi, maybe Commissioner and, uh, and Deputy Commissioner Moisey. We're making a distinction between a full-blown granting authority and an individual. Help us clarify that so that when we know what we're voting on, we know we know we can identify this distinction clearly, and the differences between the two uh, potential outcomes are clear to us. So that one, when we put it on the agenda, we know what it is we're voting on, and two, what the difference would be uh, from some of the maybe perhaps misconceptions or other alternatives that are out there. That, that's precisely our discussion, and, and that's how we'll bring it forward. Okay. Um, I'm going to cut us off. Meaty, meaty conversation. Um, and I cannot thank all three campuses enough for your patience, deliberation, and thoroughness in this. And uh, I know that the board, uh, and I think Chancellor Blackheader attributed it to my personal opinions. Uh, I think our job is to collect concerns and, and bring them. And I can't, I'm so impressed with how our committee has been uh, able to do that. Our job is not to make the decision, it's to bring it to the board with a selection of decisions that we think best fit the goals of the state. And uh, I'm very impressed with the collaborative nature and candor in discussion because it doesn't uh, come without some sacrifice. Uh, but I think that we all are agreeing that this is worth, uh, worth pursuit of, and most importantly, getting it right. Mm -hmm. President Crusoe. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your guidance. And this is not exactly about this topic, but it's tangentially related. And since it has been mentioned twice to the, in today's meeting uh, about the situation in the uh, math department, I feel compelled to clarify the record. Uh, 30 years ago, the department, 20 years ago, the math department had 29 tenure track lines. Today, we have 22 occupied lines, and in addition, 19 adjunct faculty members, which we didn't have some years ago. And I do agree that you want to have those tenure track lines filled, but it's also a, a function of the number of majors that you have. It's not about 
what has happened in history is what are the resources that we need to meet today's needs and the future needs as well. Just to give you an idea, we're currently searching for those positions and many of them have already been filled, which means that come uh, next fall, we will have those faculty members at Montana State University. But to give you an interesting fact about the situation in the nation, one of those searches was for a mathematician in pure mathematics. You know, you know how many applicants we received for that search? For just one search, for just one position, we had 500 applicants. We ended up extending offers to two positions where we were going to hire one. So I just want to make sure that we should dispel the notion that the math department is in a dire situation. Like many other good departments in the nation, sometimes we are being cherry picked because we have extraordinary faculty members that everybody wants to have, everybody else wants to have. However, we are making sure that we guarantee the quality of outstanding education that has characterized Montana State University. Thank you. Just a quick comment. Uh, I think that that pulls out something that, that I would like to talk about at some point is retention of especially research track faculty, since that's an area where if we, if we lose a star research faculty member, we both lost a, a very large startup investment oftentimes, as was mentioned, and, uh, and also it, I, I know from personal experience from friends who've uh, had a fa uh, research advisor pulled out from underneath them, it's, it's challenging for students. So uh, that, that I think is maybe a conversation that we haven't broken into as much as, as we could. It'd be nice to find a time or a form to do that. We'll, uh, we'll pick this conversation up again. Um, so board members, be prepared. In fact, we talked about the idea of possibly needing some sort of conference call in between these two meetings to present any information items associated with this. So we'll keep you posted uh, with ample notice to make sure that you're available to be a part of that. With that, um, I apologize about the delay in terminating the committee work. Um, is there any public comment related to the committee? Any public comment? Abbott, are you making your way up here or are you getting coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, member of the Re Regents, uh, for the record, my name is Doug Abbott. I'm the Provost of Montana Tech. I may not be the Provost after I say what I'm about to say. Uh, my boss misspoke. Uh, he said, if Tech is given the authority to grant a PhD, it will be given away. Trust me, the students will earn the PhD. Thank you. Thank your job safe, Doug. Any, <laughs> <laughs> Any other public comment? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for the meaty conversation, y'all. It's, it's deeply appreciated. Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Buchanan. And before we go to break, I would invite uh, the senior policy advisor to Governor Bullock to the table, uh, Jim Malloy. Welcome to our Board of Regents meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Am I on? Yes. Madam Chair, members of the board, presidents, um, commissioner, I'm here to be very brief, but on behalf of Governor Bullock to convey a sincere thank you for the important work that you're all doing and secondly, along those lines, to express on his behalf how much he looks forward to working with you um, as we move forward to, to build Montana through a strong education system at all levels. And that has already begun, and I want for the regents to know that your commissioner's office has been very, very cooperative, and we've already had some projects we've attempted to pull them into with some quick turnarounds, and they've been very, very responsive and so we look forward to a very, very constructive working relationship over the next several, hopefully, eight years. Um, along those lines, as, as you all know, the governor has set what some might characterize as an ambitious but a very important goal of increasing the number of uh, our, the percentage of our population with degrees beyond the high school diploma from 40 percent, which is where it is today, approximately to 60 percent by 2020. That's a, um, a big ask, it's a big challenge, but it's an important one as we move into and 
uh, farther into the 21st century. So with that as the background, my only uh, specific ask here today is on behalf of the governor to uh, work with your staff and with the staff of the Board of Public Education uh, to plan an agenda and convene the Board of Education sometime this spring after the legislature is done. And uh, the governor is very mindful that uh, all of you have a lot of meetings, as does he. We're not, we're not intending to convene another meeting for the sake of convening another meeting, but we hope to work meaningfully with your staffs um, to, to put together a substantive agenda and, and move forward um, looking all the way down uh, from early learning all the way through matriculation at our great universities and colleges uh, and building the state for the future. So that was really the only message. Again, thank you and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Regent Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. And, uh, you were not here this morning when we were celebrating what we perceive is a fantastic start to the higher ed agenda, the legislative process. And a huge thank you from all of us goes to not only the legislators that have participated, but you and your office who have uh, led to this stage of uh, CAP and our commitment to working with you as we not only work to implement the performance uh, expectations that we know you're behind, but uh, to steward it through the legislative process. And from my perspective, what looks like the one example of, of getting a deal done so far during the process. So thanks to you and your crew for that work. And thanks very much. And I know the commissioner was instrumental in getting that done. So thank Richard you. Krauss. Yes, uh, thank you for coming today and, and uh, talking to us. Also, thank, please convey to the governor my, my thanks and probably our thanks for mentioning the 60% goal. I, I know that other states have talked about it. I came back from a meeting talking about it, and it was just, it's a tough thing to put out there because it is so ambitious and, and you know, a 50% increase. And it just seems uh, like an awfully uh, tall mountain, but I appreciate the governor putting it out there like that, and uh, I'll do everything I can to help him achieve that. Thank you, Regent Krauss. Further questions or comments from members of the board? Then one final thank you to you for coming today and visiting with us and for the work that you have already conducted with the commissioner, with myself, and with members of the board and the presidents, and for your advocacy and for the advocacy of Governor Bullock on behalf of all of the students we serve across the Montana University system. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. At this time, we will recess until 3.15. Is there any public comment? Good afternoon, I'm Sandy Osborne. I'm chair of the uh, Coalition of Union Faculty. Chair McLean and members of the board, we have heard a lot today about salary compression and inversion and it continues to affect faculty. Um, my department at MSU is the Department of Health and Human Development, and we have a well-being model. That is how our department conceptualizes the work that we do in our teaching, research, and service. And in the well-being model, there is a financial component, and there is intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being. And I guess I'd say that some of the concerns that we have voiced today um, about salary compression and retention and all kinds of things, I, I believe it's affecting faculty not just financially, but in these other ways as well. About a year ago, at the compensation focus group that was held with Regent Robinson, that was at the Museum of the Rockies. And I'm looking at President Ingstrom particularly because at that meeting, both you and President Crusado gave pretty impassioned pleas about how much money it would take to bring the faculty salary lines up to 75% of national averages. And uh, it was very, both, and you, you emphasized the data you had collected on your campus, President Ingstrom, and President Crusado emphasized some of her experience from the previous legislature and, you know, trying to realize what's the depth of what needs to be done about the issue? 
And I guess what I'm trying to say as the, the chair of CUF is, you know, what are we going to do next? You know, what's the next step that needs to happen? And Kevin McCray, uh, Associate Commissioner Cray, um, emailed me and said, would you like to meet and talk about this as CUF? And that's exactly what we did in February. And so I wanted to um, build on what Chair McLean said earlier this morning about that meeting that was held. It was a great meeting. Uh, all of our higher education union presidents were there except one, who I guess was following the trend of the commissioner's office um, because he was out with a broken rib. He, he had fallen on a wheelbarrow trying to gather wood in the wheelbarrow, and it's Grant Mittman over there who broke his rib. But he was the only one. <laughs> What's with it? Yeah. So the point is we had all of the union presidents there for higher education. Um, we had Regent McLean. We had Marco Farrow and Tom Burgess from MEMFT. We had Kevin. And we had about 25 other uh, ad administrators from all the campuses. So about 30-some people were all together saying, what can we do? It was a great meeting. We came out with two separate groups, as uh, Chair McLean said. And I really feel like we're launched. We'll be meeting again in April. And I guess um, trying to, uh, from recent discussions with President Cruzado to, at this meeting today, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're trying to move forward in collaboration. Um, we are encouraged by the depths of the dialogue that occurred at that meeting. People really shared openly. Uh, people were willing to hear diverse viewpoints. And we're very excited about coming up with some comparators and looking at what would it take system-wide to bring um, the different faculty ranks up to um, where it needs to be, if you will, for, for compression and inversion. And we really look forward to the next meeting. So I'm giving, giving it my phrase I use, which is all good, all good. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Sandy. We appreciate uh, you coming to the table and for leading that conversation with uh, the Coalition of Union Faculty. We appreciate that. Thank you. Further public comment? Madam Chair and members of the board, I'd like to thank you for your time. My name's Seamus Manley, and I promise not to take up too much of it. I'm a senator at the University of Montana Western. I'm also a tutor there at that campus. In those roles, not only do I represent many non-traditional students and many lower income students as a senator, I also work with them on a daily basis as a tutor. And what I come to you today to talk about is the idea that's been very much discussed around our campus and others, and that's that of performance-based funding. I know it's a little bit early, perhaps, for me to bring this discussion up when I know there's so much left to do before any proposals are brought forward. But I would like to take this moment before we, any committees are really split and any discussion happens to remind all of you of the service that schools like Montana Western provide. We have many low income, many non-traditional students, and if a student doesn't meet traditional entrance standards that would get them into Missoula or Bozeman, we encourage them to come to our university as a two-year student and to then try move into a four-year program once they've shown that they can com compete at college and keep up with college. I say all this because I know decisions are coming as far as metrics go. I don't claim a large amount of personal genius to give you a, personal, a perfect solution. I honestly don't. But what I'd like to remind you all is that when we don't get to turn away students, we're never going to improve a something like a graduation rate as quickly as other universities are. That's never going to be possible at Montana Western specifically because of the service we provide to non-traditional students, to low-income students, and to members of our community as Montanans. So when these decisions are made, and when discussions do begin in the near future, I don't ask any special treatment. And I, do, again, don't claim to know the solution. I just ask that you don't forget our small colleges and that you don't forget the service provided by schools like Montana Western to other Montanans. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Seamus, for your comments and for your service. Thank you, ma'am. Further public comment? Further public comment? Further public comment? Seeing none, then? We will stand in recess until tomorrow morning.